Okay, without further ado, so I would like to welcome Daniel, uh, one of the, um, no, the lead engineer for the Curl project, uh, who has been involved in various uh, um, open source communities uh, the, throughout the eight, uh, years and uh, has been part of uh, the standardization bodies around HTTP. Um, we decided to invite him uh, to come and uh, give a lecture here at Klarna about HTTP3 and all the changes that are coming. So, welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Cool. So, HTTP3. Uh, yeah, I, I'm Daniel Stenberg, so I work with Curl since, uh, well, I founded the project 21 years ago. And uh, I had already started doing the HTTP um, client code already then, so I actually started out a little bit earlier. But uh, since just a short while ago, I started working with Curl full-time, actually. So now, after 21 years, I actually work with it. So, um, at Wolf SSL. But I started my uh, uh, efforts and uh, contributions within the IETF for about 10 years ago. IETF being the Internet Engineering Task Force, where we are developing pretty much all the fun internet protocols these days. Well, at least the uh, application layer, layers and transport layers, like HTTP and QUIC. And of course, uh, I participate in it, but uh, in this uh, organization and a lot of others do, and primarily perhaps within this talk that I'm going to do to you today, some of the companies involved are these. Some of them are well-known brand names, or all of them. So people from these companies are participating in this work, and uh, I just wanted to show you a lot of brands so that you know that uh, there are actually quite a lot of money and muscles behind this effort. It's just not me coming up with this. Uh, so I was pl am planning to talk to you a little bit about the journey from one, two, and three, and uh, some of the problems we have with perhaps one and two and why three is coming, and how this is built on quick, and a little bit how then how quick works, and then HP three being a new HP version on top of quick. <clears throat> some of the challenges with this, because it isn't uh, crazy enough, it isn't just straightforward, replace everything with something new. And uh, it is coming soon, and I will get back to that. Uh, we'll see about soon, but uh, maybe. Uh, I intend to not uh, give you too many bytes and bits here. I'm going to presume that most of you know the foundations of TCP, IP, and uh, networking and stuff, you know, bytes and bits, they fly. We don't need to care about the specifics, really. Um, and these specifications, HTTP3 and QUIC, they're not shipped yet. As I said, it'll come soon. But that means that a lot of, if we dig into the details, they're not really exactly written in stone yet. Some minor changes will uh, they are actually keep on happening all the time. The discussions are ongoing. Um, and this is a public presentation. You can take photos and share it if you want to. And sure, uh, interrupt and ask me at any time. I'm not sure exactly how it's going to work out with the streaming and everything, but it's fine with me. And it's actually more fun if you have particular questions about details I'm saying, or you can question them or whatever, and we can dig into those details. We can skip a few slides if we want to. Okay, so HTTP is a protocol that has been around for a while. Um, Sir Tim Berners-Lee called it HTTP when he created the web in 1989, I think. HTTP, HTTP was a really, really basic protocol back in those days. It was basically just one line and raw data back, so it wasn't really a protocol. But uh, HTTP 1 was created in 96, and we created HTTP 2 in 2015, and now we're looking at HTTP 3. HTTP just sort of a reminder, it looks like this, you know, here's a request from a client and you get a response back from a server. Request and headers, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Just to remind everyone. So, HTTP started out over TCP, right? So, TCP is a protocol, very basic. It's, it's, it's a, I like to visualize the protocol as a chain with individual links here. All the links have to be there for the chain to be correct. So it's a protocol on top of IP. IP just transports uh, packets, and TCP makes sure that those packets actually sort of create a connection. The bytes, all right, uh, they, there's a three-way handshake. So we send a ping, pong, ping, and then we have a connection. We have established a connection, and we can transfer data back and forth. There's actually a 
sort of a byte stream them between these two endpoints. And of course, it's um, a reliable connection. If we lose a packet, they will detect it and resend that packet. So you know that you're sending data in order and they will arrive in the other end in that same order or, or the connection can also break. But that's sort of what happens. They will arrive in that order or not at all. And it's all in clear text. So anyone on the network can read your data because that's how TCP works. An old established thing. We've used it since the 80s, so um, approaching 40 years or so. We know it. <clears throat> but today we also have a lot of things over HTTPS, right? And HTTPS is then TLS added on top of this. So it's HTTP and we have the TCP and we have TLS on top of this. Because if we look at how the trends look today uh, on the web, this is um, data from Firefox telemetry from Mozilla. So we can see just some trends on uh, how page loads are done on the internet today or as seen from Firefox. So we can basically see that we're going up uh, to, well, Maybe 80% of all page loads today done by Firefox are done over HTTPS. So, I mean, that, that's a fair, a pretty big majority. We're talking HTTPS primarily here. And looking at the same data, slightly just skewed differently from Chrome, we can safely say that Chrome has the same sort of trend. It's going up. Maybe not 80% on all of those graphs. It's split out differently here. They split it on, on platform instead of continent. So, but still, 80-ish somewhere going up. I'm sure it won't hit 100 anytime soon, but it'll go up even more. So, a lot of HTTPS. HTTPS then being TLS on top of TCP. That's how we do it with HTTPS at least, right? So, <clears throat> this is the added tra the transport layer security. So, it adds a handshake so that from the TCP, the TCP connection is established and then we add another handshake, right? or a few ping pongs back and forth, and we have a TLS connection on top of that. And we get added privacy and security. Nobody can snoop in your connection, nobody can interfere or change content. That's what we want. That's, that's the reality that we live with today, right? So that's how the web looks like. So the HTTP, as we have had it, have it already now, is based on TCP then. And we started out with HTTP 1.1 back in 99. We started with something else, but in 99, we got 1.1. .1. Um, since we have this uh, client uh, server protocol in, in HTTP, and due to some uh, fun uh, mistakes we did in the protocol or, um, back in the early days, it has turned out to be a very ping pong protocol, right? So we do request and a response, and request and response, and we do a ping pong, and we're always waiting for the other end. We ask for something, and we wait for the response, and then we ask again. So there's a, long, a lot of waiting here. Ping pong, ping pong. And that's, we solve that, we. Browsers solve that, any HTTP client solve that by opening up a lot of connections instead, so we can s spread out all that waiting on many different connections. Ping pong on all of them. That's fine. Um, so that turns out to be a really horrible use of TCP. TCP was invented for est long established connections, sort of get up to speed over time and then re be really fast. Instead, we created a web where we set up short-lived TCP connections and we kill them off immediately. Uh, for Firefox, the medium number of requests done per TCP connection is one. So basically, each TCP connection is set up an HTTP request is done and you kill it off again because you have so many TCP connections. We have to kill them off. We can't keep them up. So it's a horrible use. We never, basically never really get up to speed because TCP has this slow start period in the beginning. We need data to get up to speed. And when we get up to speed, we kill it because we have so many. And then we also introduced this fun thing that's called HTTP head of line blocking. We have this ping pong problem. We set up six different connections typically to each host name, but we want to get 200 images from the website. 200 images, we have six connections. Which connection are you going to send your next request on? Really difficult, you have six lines. Six lines in the supermarket, right? Which line is fastest? Not the one you pick, <laughs> it's going to be some other. And, and, and the browser basically ha has that problem all the time. Complicated. Of course, uh, the, the web looks at it last today because uh, all the clever site owners and everyone in here too have invented fun workarounds that we could actually sort of 
get around all of those shortcomings in, um, in HTTP 1. And one major fix for the shortcomings in HTTP 1 was HTTP 2 that shipped in, in 2015 that introduced many logical stream over um, a single connections. So then we switched from all of those connections, um, many connections per host, to a one connection per host. That turned out to be really good for TCP uh, transfer speeds, because then suddenly we can have long-lived TCP connections. We can get up to speed. We can actually saturate the, the pipe much better in both directions, faster. That's good, right? So instead, we introduced another thing called TCP head of line blocking. Previously, we had the HTTP head of line blocking when the HTTP request in head of you could be slow and you had to wait. Now, instead, we changed the reality of the world into one TCP connection per host. And what happens when you lose one of those packets in that TCP connection? You lose one packet and you have a hundred streams going over that connection. One packet is gone, a hundred streams are waiting for that single packet to get retransmitted. And if you lose single packets more and more often, a hundred streams are waiting more and more often. So it's really not a good situation. HTTP 2 turns out to be a pretty shitty protocol when you have a bad network, which most of us in here, we don't have a bad network most of the time. So most of the times for us, it's good, but um, in situations, not good. At, at the same time, when we have had HTTP 1 and HTTP 2 come up in the world, we have another uh, factor going on at the same time that we in the protocol world called ossification. Basically, it means that whatever is put out on the internet today, it stays like that for a long time. So if, if you imagine your internet as full of boxes, as you know, it is full of boxes. A lot of routers, load balancers, NATs, gateways, blah, 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 all sorts of things out there. They ship traffic back and forth through the net from, on different layers in the, in the networking stack. Some of them are IP, TCP, HTTP, all of different layers. They were all programmed to handle this. They all, I mean, people like you and me, we wrote code for these boxes 10 years ago. And these boxes are still out there. And they are written to handle the network as it looks today, right? And then we ship it out and it gets stuck out there for decades. And that's how it looks like. So um, they're made to handle the network as it appears today. Very few of them can actually handle the network how it appears tomorrow, maybe, or something. When we introduce new things, they don't understand it because that's not how we did it back in the day. So it'll cause problems. And these boxes are upgraded much slower than the edges, right? Your browsers at home or at the office, you upgrade your browsers, it upgrades itself basically every week or within a few days, it's new. Even the servers we upgrade, uh, not as often as browsers, but we at least upgrade them every year, every six months, every quarter, something. These boxes in between, not so much. We bought them a long time ago, they're good, they're in there. So the internet then, being the, all those boxes, the client and the server, they are fine, but there are all those green ones in between here. There are the middle boxes. They're, they don't move. They know how things work or how things worked before. So why is, why is that a problem then? Eh, turns out to be a huge problem today because for example, we introduced HTTP 2, then uh, as I mentioned, we shipped the spec in 2015. If you try to speak HTTP 2 over the internet in clear text, th that means basically you, you communicate over TCP on port 80 somewhere. There are a whole lot of boxes that know that TCP port 80, that is HTTP 1. So if you speak HTTP 2 over that, they will help you and fix your uh, data in there and you know replace some headers and stuff. But they don't look the same anymore. So they basically just ruin your traffic. So they're effectively pre preventing us from using HTTP2 in clear text over the internet. So many boxes helps, help us out there. That's HTTP. Um, we can uh, improve things in the TCP layer as well, right? Why not fix TCP and make TCP better? This, uh, one of these inventions is the TCP fast open, which is a faster way to negotiate TCP. Send data earlier in the TCP handshake. Awesome. It is, uh, I think it's, it came, the spec came seven, eight years ago. Um, it's a fun way to do it. It turns out to, that's the TCP fast open, trying to use this in the wild. There are enough boxes out there that know <laughs> how a TCP 
uh, handshake looks like. So they know that when you're sending these bits, that's wrong. Throw them away. So basically, that ends up not being the fast open. It turns out to be really slow open many times because you have to resend uh, that uh, SYN packet again without the fast open bit set. So to the extent that nowadays no browser and no operating systems are running with this enabled by default because of this, we have to have some silly fallbacks anyway because it fails so often and in mysterious ways. It's really complicated. In Firefox, we fought with this for a year, sort of a lot of man hours and powers put into this before ah, we give up. We'll fix it in another protocol, maybe. And then the same thing then also goes for what if we could invent a new protocol, right? We don't have to fix TCP. We could just invent a new protocol. TCP and UDP shouldn't have to be the only ones. But it's here again, it's even worse here. Right? We can't introduce a new protocol next to these. We tried to do SCTP years ago. Still, still the same problem. Your uh, routers at home are here mostly the, the guilty party, right? They can only NAT translate TCP and UDP. They can't NAT anything else. So basically, trying any other protocols, dead end. Won't work. You can introduce a new compression algorithm over HTTP. It doesn't work either in the clear text because a lot of boxes know how you do compression over HTTP. They know it's gzip, right? So if you send something else, eh, they will just ruin your traffic. So basically, we have to encrypt stuff. We have to pr pretty much encrypt as much as possible to prevent all of those boxes in between to see your traffic. Stop helping us. We don't need your help. <laughs> so encrypt everything so that it basically becomes a, a, an opaque byte stream of random noise. And that's what we want. So in spite of this ossification, that stuff sort of um, gets stuck in time in, in the middle of the internet. We introduce quick which then is that new transport protocol that we can't introduce i just said but uh, I'll, I'll get to you in a second exactly how that worked so quick is actually then a, another experiment from uh, that company called google they have a fairly uh, well used client and uh, some of you have used their services at times too so they actually they're in a pretty good situation to actually run experiments on, on a really wide global internet scale. Um, already several years ago, they only traffic between Google, Chrome and Google services uh, took, I mean, they, they ran quick then, their version of quick. 7% of the internet traffic then used quick, only between, between Chrome and, and, and Google services. So basically, they, they invented or tried out a little experiment, basically sending HTTP2 over UDP and had their own crypto and everything. But they proved it to work at the web scale. We can actually, again, replace how we transfer HTTP over the network. Just change everything over the wire and unpack it on the other end and it'll appear as HTTP again. So they took it to the IETF. Let's make this a standard in 2015. And, that's, and if you remember, HTTP 2 came exactly 2015. So it was sort of in the exact time frame. So I, I think that was sort of made it, took another year until the, the Quick Working Group was created in 2016 with an immense uh, attention and activity because this was interesting to a lot of people, uh, funny enough. And uh, well, so the, the ITF then, being the ITF, said, awesome, let's do this. But so doing everything sort of mushed together in one transfer, you could just send something in and you got HTTP out in the other end. Not nice. We have to split this up as, as a transport protocol and an application protocol. That wasn't at all what, Quick, what Google did with Quick. But, but the ITF said, so we could do other protocols over this transport protocol, like DNS or whatever. So they then split it up into two protocols, the Quick protocol and application protocols on top of that. This has the lovely uh, effect that Google Quick is a completely different protocol than the ITF Quick, and they're both called Quick. So it's, it's the Quick and the Quick, but we're trying to call them like the, the Google Quick and the Real Quick or something like that. So when you, when, you can, when you do a new transport protocol, you can fix things, right? You can fix this TCP head of line blocking problem that we had one connection and a lot of streams over it, and when we lose one packet in there, all streams are affected. But we can fix that, right? If every packet just knows which stream it belongs to, all the other streams can actually go on when we lose one packet. Or a few streams can be affected, but 98 streams can, can go on. 
and we can fix this ping, a lot of hand back and forth to do established connections. We don't have to have those five ways or whatever it is with TCP and TLS. They can actually introduce a zero round trip handshake. Um, and we can fix the TFO problem, that is, send data really early on in the handshake. Um, so so um, we can get even faster uh, round trips, even more data. We get data much earlier in, in the establishment of connections or streams. And we can encrypt much more. E even TC in the TCP TLS case, we leave a lot of data on the wire, right? So we can change TCP bits because someone knows about the TCP bits. Here, we can encrypt even more, leave even less for those boxes in between to understand what's going on. They can't interfere anymore. Um, so ideally, hopefully, this will put, pave the road to actually allow us to change this and even in the future. Hopefully, ideally, this won't ossify as much or as easily as we did in the past. So to do this, we build everything on top of UDP. Because, we, as I said, we have TCP and UDP. They are the ones. We can change them. So we do, instead of um, putting a protocol next to these sort of in the protocol stack, we put them on top of UDP. We just use UDP as if it was IP, just a packet layer sending things. And then we build a TCP-like thing on top of that. So we handle retransmissions and congestion control and everything on top of that. But then I, I want to emphasize that uh, doing things on top of UDP doesn't mean that it's actually UDP. We're just using UDP as a packet transport layer, right? UDP, you know, this connection does, and you can just send a lot of stuff, and you don't know if it ends up in the other end or not. Uh, can change the order and everything. That's UDP. But in this case, we do quick. We just use UDP um, as a transport just for packets. So we have to uh, add uh, logic and, and uh, glue stuff on top of that so, we have be, so that we become TCP-like. And we then can also add stream support already in the transport protocol, because why not? Previously, when we talked HTTP2, we did streams in the HTTP layer. Uh, and what's the difference, right? Um, I'll get to that. But Quick here is a transport protocol that provides streams, pretty much like actually SCTP did in, back in the days. Actually, you can do that with SSH as, as well. Pretty much has streams in the, in the transport, pretty much. Um, so you can do a lot of individual streams within a, a physical connection. Um, right. And they're independent here. And th that's the way we fix that head of line blocking. So if you're, you set up a connection, you send 100 streams, and you lose a few packets because you have a packet loss. Only the streams that are actually in those packets are affected by this. So you can send three streams, lose a packet in somewhere, and two of the streams can go on while you're waiting for the retransmission of that single packet that belongs to just one of those streams which has the fun effect then that you can actually deliver data. Like from a web server with HTTP 3, you can deliver images in one order and they can arrive in the other order uh, in the client side. They can change since they're independent. They're individually, they're reliable and they're in order, but between themselves, they're independent. Um, basically, that means that before, when we did it TCP-like, it was this chain. So when you lost the red packet, the green has had to wait, right? Because it's a chain, they're all interconnected. You can't just go on until all the links are there. But now with Quick, there are separate chains. If we lose the blue link here, it doesn't matter. The yellow one can go on anyway. And the blue just has to wait for, it, for its link to reappear on the net. Sorry, can we try to read the box <laughs> for the one plus three? To be clear, it's selective repeat, so you only need that link. You don't need to repeat from that point on. Uh, no, exactly. So, no, you you retransmit just that data. Yes. Actually, that yes. is missing. Um, so yeah, it's actually it's actually different than uh, TCP in the details how the retransmission is made, but it's the concept is very similar. Um, right, and that is then on the transport layer, which means that we can do a lot of different application protocols over Quick because Quick is just a transport. It doesn't know an HTTP stuff. It just it's like TCP with with streams. Um, so that could be any protocol. But when when uh, when ITF started working on this, it became obvious pretty quick huh, huh, uh, that uh, 
working on all these protocols at the same time, so that turned out to be a lot of work. So basically the decision came out really early on. So let's just focus on Quick and HTTP and all the other protocols are to be done after the first release. So while we will see other application protocols, I'm positive. The, the decision has been to only focus on HTTP right now. So any discussion that brings up other protocols will just say, wait until after we ship this. <clears throat> so uh, the DNS is one of those. Uh, I think already in the first, uh, when, when the quick working group, group was set up in, in the ITF, DNS was one of those protocols that uh, was brought up. So maybe that will come. Uh, WebRTC is often also mentioned because WebRTC is pretty much, it wants a lot of this. And it's <laughs> they have the most ugly hack already on top of everything. So maybe it would, yeah, I don't know. So then, HTTP3 is this HTTP over Quick. So HTTP3 is that application layer for HTTP on top of Quick. And so we, basically, you could you can't do HTTP2 over Quick because Quick is is a different transport in in so many ways that we had to make a new HTTP on top of of Quick. But it doesn't mean that HTTP3 adds a lot of different things, right? But first, I'm, we're talking again about changing how we transfer HTTP while the prime, uh, you know, the good old semantics of HTTP is still there. So we still, you know, we still do a request and we have methods and verbs and we have headers and body and we have the same in responses. So all this is the same. If you're looking at it from an application programmer or a user on it, you probably don't even have to care about the, how all the fundamentals underneath actually work, but because we will see HTTP as we have seen it before. It will con continue to look like HTTP fr from, from an outsider's perspective. And uh, then it sort of put differently, we did everything in ASCII or text-based back in HTTP 1, and then we added uh, binary transfers and we did multiplexing in HTTP 2. And in HTTP 3, we actually make HTTP simpler because HTTP 3 made, was made easier and we moved the multiplexing into the transport in quick. Uh, if, if you want to look at how then uh, just a networking stack looks like with HTTP 2 versus HTTP 3, HTTP 2 is the simple IP, TCP, TLS, HTTP 2. Actually, HTTP 1 looks exactly the same, right? Just a different version. Uh, and this is how we did everything. And we still do it like that uh, since a long time. But now we do it on top of UDP instead. We add Quick as a transport layer. It has TLS 1.3 encryption and security glued into there. Um, and TLS is not on top of TCP here, which is fun. I'll get back to that. Uh, and then we add HTTP 3 on top of that. So, you know, easy PC. <laughs> Just do that, right? How hard can that be? So uh, looking at then comparing HTTP 2 and HTTP 3 feature-wise, they're really similar. They're basically the same. So we don't introduce a, new, a lot of new things between HTTP 2 to HTTP 3. We're pretty much on par. We just replace everything under the hood and HTTP is here again. There are some differences and, slight, and possibly things like getting better early data and, and uh, faster handshakes that are uh, sort of characteristics of the transport that will benefit HTTP 3, but it, it doesn't add new features or anything for HTTP 3. So they're, they're very similar in, in features and uh, functionality. But it's bound to be faster than, um, since we have much faster handshakes, typically zero RTT. And I, I know that uh, early measurements that I won't show you because they're from Google and they're from Google Quick, but they estimated somewhere uh, in the neighborhood of 70% of all um, Quick connections actually used zero RTT uh, connections. So Z and zero RTT, that's basically, you had a connection before with that server. We're here again, we just sort of, we don't even negotiate anything. Just set up the connection and we, we go. So much faster connections and early data that works, and you can actually send a lot of more early data with uh, HTTP 3 than you can with HTTP 2 and TLS. So ideally, this will also make like a browser able to send more data and actually get going much faster than you could before. And independent streams, of course, makes it much better in, in lossy network situations. Um, and how much, uh, how much faster this is, ah, that's a good question. 
I think, I think uh, exactly as, as the situation is and was with HTTP2, this is the, the, the best situation is for those with the worst kind of networks, right? They're, they have a really crappy network with really long latencies. They will have the biggest benefits of this. And they are not in, we are not in this room, I'm pretty sure. Or we are probably possibly the, those persons when we're vacationing somewhere with much worse network. So when we're in sort of, you know, millisecond latency land, it's not going to be that notable. <clears throat> okay, but how do we get to HTTP 3? I just explained to you how HTTP 3 is done over quick, quick is done over UDP. HTTPS colon slash slash, what's that? Um, we used those URLs on, on a number of places. <laughs> I, I don't think you've noticed. Uh, and they imply TCP on, on port 443, and then you negotiate TLS on that. But, but um, so a lot of those URLs, but those URLs are not our friends anymore because we want to go quick over UDP. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the way it is. We can't change these URLs. We, nobody's even suggesting that we're going to introduce another scheme for URLs or anything. We're, we have these URLs and we're going to live with them. So we just have to work with this. So instead we introduce, we actually introduced this header a while ago. This called alt service. So a server that offers an HTTP 3 end or uh, public facing server, they, they introduce a, a header called alt service that says, I'm also over here and I'm speaking this protocol on this port for, for this many seconds into the future. So, so uh, if you talk to uh, your favorite example.com, it'll say, I'm also over here speaking HTTP 3. So a, a browser or a client can then connect to the other server in the background or in the next connection or whatever and speak HTTP 3 on that. Uh, endpoint instead, which then, as you realize, that becomes a fun. Uh, you have to, that's a round trip, right? We have to talk to a server first to know that the server is actually on the other end. So, therefore, you need to cache this information uh, and other fun things. This is a, a, an area of, of a lot of discussions, of course, and can possibly and will be improved and, and debated more. Um, because uh, you can imagine, uh, sorry, just one second. Uh, if you do it like this, you connect to the HTTP server and everything works uh, uh, nicely. And uh, you shut down your laptop, you, you do this at home. You shut down your laptop at home and you take it to work and you open up there. So then suddenly you end up in a situation that's completely different than the one you had at home. Maybe you block UDP, maybe it doesn't work. So all these clients that they have to have fancy fallbacks anyway. So mm, it's going to be an interesting case. So when you start your browser again, there's going to be a lot of races with old connections and new connections, trying out what works. Yes, couldn't you do this with ALPN to make it faster? Uh, no, not since this is quick and ALPN, as you, but when you negotiated it over TCP and TLS. But before the re request and response, in the, it's just one ping pong and then you, then you know. It's on the TLS level, ALPN, right? Yes, it's on TLS. So you don't even need a request. Yeah, but I, uh, uh, you can possibly do that. I mean, in theory, you can, of course, do that. You can just put it in other ALPN. But ALPN, that's a TLS extension. That means I'm talking this protocol behind myself, sort of. And that's not true here, right? You don't speak HTTP 3 behind that TLS established connection. I was thinking like an alt SVC on ALPN. Right. It's Which, like a hack. <laughs> it's a kind of awful hack. Yes. <laughs> but so, yeah, you, you could possibly do that, but you won't gain that very much, right? Because you'd still need to get that response back. So, well, yeah, sure. You can invent other ways to do this. And I'm sure we will see other ways to do this. And I'm pretty sure that people will also just race. Don't even wait for this. Just try it out, right? Does it work? It might be faster. You don't have to wait for a round trip if you just try it and negotiate. And if it negotiates, it, it's there. And since Quick is always encrypted and always authenticated, you know that if it's, if it's connected, you know that it's the right server anyway. So you can just try it. Maybe. I'm sure that um, uh, people will do that. And I'm sure, and I know that some early implementations already do it like that. Uh, a box. 
So apologies if you're about to answer this, but is there a conventional port for uh, for Quick? There is a convention. It's not standard. It's a they are using 443 on UDP. But since, since the, this is the documented way to go to, to bootstrap to HTTP3, you don't actually need standard port, right? Because you, you're always supposed to get this header and go back to that port. I was just thinking if you just went ahead and fired a UDP packet at that port, like um, hoping for the best. Because you said that, I mean, you could do these two things in parallel, right? You could fire the UDP packet, hope the connection works over quick, and then if it doesn't, wait for the TCP response and or the TLS response. Yeah, exactly, case. and that's pretty much what everyone is going to do anyway if you shut down your laptop and you open it up again, because then you don't know if it works anymore. So then, and then you don't want to lose that round trip time to just figure out it didn't work. So I'm sure that clients' browsers, they will raise them. Immediately when you open your laptop, they will raise both to make sure that if the quick one fails, you will have the HTTP 2 one or one HTTP 1. Erase everything. A lot of races. <coughs> in, the, in, the, in the browser land, everything is so, such a sort of important to a millisecond level. So if you can gain a few milliseconds, it's worth it. Sort of throw everything at it. And the, the servers can handle it. <coughs> so, okay. Well, will this work then? Can we do this actually? Can, and who's going to do it? And will it be interesting? Will, will we use it soon? Uh, there are some fun challenges of doing this. Uh, uh, some of you can already figure out some of them, but I can uh, highlight a few more. So uh, somewhere around 3 to 7% of all attempted quick connections, they fail. Why do they fail? Well, someone in between. As I mentioned, this is an ossification, and not only ossification, just not because people are sort of helpful, but a lot of organization companies, they just block everything on UDP because who's going to use UDP high speed over the internet, right? That's just DOS attempts. Stop it. So uh, a lot of companies, basically, they just block everything UDP. And of course, if they block everything UDP, you can't do it quick so, somewhere. And these numbers, uh, I, th I think Google says 3%, Facebook says 7 and uh, I think none of them have, uh, have really tried this as a, at a really wide enterprise scale yet. So I'm, I'm figuring this num these numbers might go up. And of course, numbers behind from enterprises tend to also not exist in this. So who knows? A lot of uh, connections will fail. So we have to have these fun uh, fallbacks. And of course, they will be have to be existing. Oh, I mean, we have to have those fallbacks for a long time into the future until these fail numbers actually start to be really, really low. Uh, and I'm sure that will take a long time. Hopefully, of course, Quick will prove itself worthy of having so companies will actually remove the blocks and say that we can handle everything anyway. But, but just as a side note, how do you differentiate a, a DDoS attack from a quick attempt, right? It's just random noise on a port. It's really, really difficult to do it at the high scale. A lot of quick traffic, a lot of DDoS, pretty much the same thing. So introducing then a new protocol that is more encrypted and encrypted in new ways than before makes it an awesomely CPU intensive protocol. So a, a typical... All right, I just had a quick sure, question on, sure. on the previous one. Uh, is there any? Is there going to be any attempt to standardize the fallback algorithm? Because I think if there's a diversification of that, it could be difficult to for servers or clients to kind of agree on a fallback algorithm. Well, the the servers don't fall back here, right? So that's the just the, the client, yeah. But the server to... has to anticipate that in some way. Yeah, I'm not sure they have to, since they. I mean, they're, they're basically in this case, they're HTTP servers. They're pretty stateless, and it doesn't matter. It comes in there or it comes in there. It, it, for them, it doesn't really matter. So I think the, the, the fallback is easy from the servers. It's the clients that's going to have to do. And it's really complicated, and I'm not sure that it's going to be standardized. And I know that they're already struggling with that because I, I told you the easy, uh, the easy version is when someone blocks the UDP port and say, sure, it fails to connect. But what turns out to be much more complicated is when they rate limit the UDP traffic. So you get a connection, but it's really slow. So if you would have used the TCP one, that would have been fast. How do you know your connection is rate limited and fall back to the TCP one? That is a tricky one. And I haven't actually seen anyone actually solve that. So I, I, 
I'm sure this is going to be an area of, of um, a lot of fun going forward. <laughs> but, the, but then back to the CPU intensiveness. Actually, a, a server serving basically the same bandwidth with HTTP 3 as with HTTP 2 spends somewhere around two to three times the CPU on, on, um, on when they do this, which of course is a lot of CPU. And then you have to go back and consider, is it worth it? How much more do, do the clients actually get out of this? And then you see that, oh, well, they get a few percentage faster in, in some cases. So I'm sure that the CPU usage here is going to be a major block for, for now. Short term then, and this is because, of course, not only is the UDP stacks ironically very unoptimized, so UDP is actually really bad in, in Linux because, again, we haven't really done this with UDP before, so nobody has ever really cared about the UDP stacks at high speeds like this. So TCP we have tweaked and optimized and worked on for for a long time, and, and now it's time for the UDP uh, one to, to get some attention. So this will get better, but we also have a case where we can't uh, hardware offload the encryption with Quick as we did with uh, as we do with TLS on over uh, TCP. So that's a dual situation here. The optimizing things or handing things over to hardware is going to improve as well, but uh, we're not there. <clears throat> There's a funny <laughs> TLS layer, and this is now going really into the weeds here, because that's what we do. Uh, and TLS, you know, that that's done over TCP normally, or that's how it's invented, transport layer security. And then we speak of TLS records. We send TLS records over TCP. TLS records, that's, uh, that's, they consist of TLS messages. You put messages into a record, you send it over TCP. That means that all existing SSL libraries, they're done for TCP, right? Because that's how we do TLS, and they all talk about TLS messages. No, sorry, TLS, I can't confuse myself. They actually talk, they talk about TLS frames. So um, the point here being that Quick changed this. They're not sending the same packets over Quick as they do over TLS or over TCP, and too many acronyms. Okay. So, um, Basically, it means that no, none of the existing TLS libraries actually export the API necessary to talk TLS over Quick. So all, whatever you do with TLS, you have to have a new library or a new API made for you so that you can do it over Quick instead. Uh, and not only is the messaging different, they also want other secrets. So you actually need at least two different new things in your TLS library. And and you know how fast your TLS libraries and Java and everything how they, it moves in the world. It takes a while. So it, it'll take a while until uh, the TLS libraries and everyone can talk TLS the way that Quick wants it to move. A question? A, a box? Uh, I actually had a little unrelated question, but just in general. Uh, so. You're talking a lot about like clients as in browsers, uh, whereas like in the current like world we live in, there's a lot of ar microservice architecture where you have a lot of different clients and servers living actually in the same network. Do you think that HTTP three will help a lot there? Like there we already have these connections within the same like data centers that are loss somewhat lossless. Uh, you have quite good connections and you have the clients and the servers being optimized and already having long-lived connections that you don't need to reestablish constantly. Right. Within data centers, already HTTP2 had a hard time to motivate itself, right? So within a data center, I, I, don't, I don't see why you would use HTTP3 at all. Maybe long term, because you can sort of go with one stack instead of having many different ones. But short term, no, I think you'd stick to... If, if you're in, HTTP. If you, uh, yeah, to, um, even HTTP 1. Yeah. So in, in, within a data center, this, that, that's a different nature. So you can keep things simple there. And you have much more control, much closer between all the involved parties. So this is not for that. OK, cool. I just wanted to mention then that when, when HTTP 2 shipped, they also that also introduced a fun TLS thing in that we we wanted to use that uh, ALPN thing we mentioned before, so you wanted that ALPN extension in TLS to negotiate that we want to do HTTP two. 
That turned out to be a huge problem back in the HTTP2 days because the latest version of OpenSSL didn't include that extension. So you had to actually use the, well, not the, la the latest had it, but not the one that everyone was using. So it took a while until everyone had upgraded their OpenSSL versions. In this situation, OpenSSL haven't even started doing this uh, fun extension that is needed to do quick. So we're far behind in, in comparison to the HTTP2 days. What's interesting is that all those people working on Quick, because and there's a, I'll show you a list of other no names. And there are a lot of teams working on Quick implementations, and basically all of them they have their own TLS stack as well. So they're all modifying their own stacks, so they can do it. It's easy if you're you know constrained environment and you just want to ship a client that does it or ship a server that does it. But for the greater universe of things, it'll take a while. So quick then being on top of UDP and it includes TLS and all this fun TLS uh, mumbo jumbo, it'll make sure that the quick implementations will stay user land for a very, very long time. So they will become, they will remain libraries for you to include in your applications. Um, and not, they're not going to appear in kernels. You won't see in a socket API for this, <coughs> which is both good and bad. It makes it possible for them to iterate really fast and can develop. And that's really how we, we got to this point that we are right now. S but it also means that there's no standard quick API, for example. So all these different libraries, they have their own API. So you, uh, yeah, you get married to one of those. If you want to invest in one of those libraries, you, you're going down that road. And, and since these libraries then are also using these funny TLS things that are also not standard, right? So you get into an API that is built for a library that is using a TLS library um, that has adopted for this. So it's uh, a lot of things that are early and, and complicated. And of course, then we have a general lack of tool. We've used TCP for a while, right? I, I guess most of you grew up and you learned TCP a long time or saw TCP a long time ago. And we've, le we've been accustomed to things like sequence numbers and windowing. And, you know, we can see things in Wireshark and all of that is gone now, right? So there's no more of that. Everything is new. And, and everything is encrypted. So you have to get the encryption keys, you have to decrypt it, and you have to use a tool that can show you this, which Wireshark can, and the, basically the only tool I think that is rough, uh, a bit up to date with this. So I'm sure this is going to be fun to debug different implementations talking quick, badly uh, over networks. <clears throat> so, a few challenges, but uh, we're going there. So, there is actually a ship date said in the quick working group working on these protocols, they actually say that they're going to ship this in July. It still says so, I checked it just yesterday, I think. It won't ship in July. Um, <laughs> so, the, there's actually uh, an interrupt test in London in two weeks, and uh, that's number 12, I think. They have a lot of them, and there's going to be more. But I think actually they. The intent is still to try to ship the, the spec this year. So maybe it'll happen this year, maybe not. Yeah. You would imagine that if, if they would actually ship it in July, they would, they would pro pretty much not be any discussions left, right? We should just argue about spelling mistakes now and, and not actual protocol details, but there are issues filed every day still. So uh, we're not really, really there. And uh, there are a lot of fun uh, uh, implementations. If you want to run this or try it at home, there are dozens of them in any imaginable programming language that you like. HTTP 3 has lagged behind a bit, but they're coming now. So I think there, there might be about 10 HTTP 3 implementations. There are far more quick implementations. Uh, I think because most of these teams, they actually did the, the bulk of the quick parts before they took on the HTTP 3 parts. Also the uh, specification was done in that order, basically. So all of these big players are there, all the browsers, all the big CDNs, the Facebook, um, and they all have their own uh, implementations, basically. There's no browser shipping it yet, which I think is a bit um, sad and comparing with the same time of, I mean, when HTTP 2 was in this state, we had a lot of implementations already, both in servers and, and browsers. So this is clearly in a worse state than we were with HTTP 2 in the, in the same comparable time frame. Both Chrome and Safari say that they have um, 
versions in development or sort of in-house. So there's this little, I'm trying to get them to raise who's going to actually provide a version for us to try first. But <coughs> we'll see. So there's no available open source server to try out yet, and uh, curl doesn't support it either. <coughs> so I just wanted to mention that. So, so of course, I want to support it in curl as soon as possible, but it's really complicated, all of these challenges, as I mentioned. So I have added support for all services, and I'm going to work with these two libraries to actually make it happen. Both of these libraries have HP3 support very recently. So I might be able to actually support HP3 really soon if I just go with one of these libraries that are patched to actually support uh, the TLS parts. So basically I have to marry not only one of these libraries, but I have to decide to use one of those TLS libraries that one of these uh, quiche uses boring and uh, SSL. And, and GCP can use boring or open SSL. <clears throat> okay, so with all this, sort of, yeah, there are, there are ups and there are problems and there are challenges. So sh for sure, the <laughs> looking, it's not, uh, it's not a, I think it's not a crazy guess to say that HTTP 3 will take a little time before it's, uh, it hits, before it reaches adoption to any significant level. I mean, outside of the big ones. I'm confident that as soon as you will hear or read about HTTP 3 in the news or media, Facebook and Google, they will be there and probably a few other of the, those big ones. Th that's not really what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about uh, us who are not among those top five uh, sites or, or machines. So um, it will grow slower than HTTP 2 did, I'm sure. Because uh, also back to the why question, why would anyone go, why would you invest and, and actually deploy it to be three? What's the gain for your users? It's not immediately obvious at this point and a, a lot of problems. So I'm sure some will stick to HP too. But then a lot of talk about quick in general is for the long term. Quick is often referred to within the IETF, within the protocol world as the, you know, the TCP successor. So maybe quick should more rather be seen as what, what are we going to use for the long term in a decade, two decades. What's maybe quick for the, in the long term is going to replace TCP, a post TCP world as is mentioned sometimes within the ITF. So that is, I think maybe that is a better way to look at it. So yeah, maybe long term, this is, this is what we will have short term and eh, not so much. And what fun is I, I mentioned before that HTTP then being the application protocol that the group has focused on in initially to sort of narrow the scope. So a lot of other things have been, let's do this as well. Uh, no, too much work, postpone it. So there's a lot of piled up things and piled up demand for a lot of new fun thing, protocol-ish things that we can do. So while immediately when Quick V1 has shipped, there's going to be a Quick V1 group uh, <laughs> coming and they want to do things like multipath because why not? TCP already has it. Forward error connection, also another uh, sort of transport protocol, um, holy grail. And unreliable streams. Sure, you want to do UDP over quick. Uh, <coughs> it sounds a little bit ironic, but apparently that's a, a really common use case, at least like within gaming and stuff. So you have both reliable and unreliable connections. So why not have them as reliable and unreliable streams within a single quick connection? As it makes sense to some at least. And more application protocols are being discussed. So um, we're not quite there yet. So takeaways from all this then. It's coming soon and it's going to be encrypted always. It's pretty much similar to HTTP2 feature-wise. Quick is a complicated transport over UDP. I didn't even get into a lot of the other, there are more details to Quick that you can read up on. Um, <coughs> There are a lot of challenges to overcome that will inhibit it uh, to, to reach a uh, wide audience short term. Oh, sorry, this is an old slide too, because they said it would be live before summer 2019, back in the day when I wrote the slide. Uh, that's not going to happen. A question somewhere? No? Box question. So for uh, the use case in, 
for quick is fairly obvious. There is high loss, uh, high latency land, basically cellular, satellite, and so how is the interest from the mobile area? So like Africa yeah, and those areas would be very beneficial. Yes, really they are. Yeah, yeah, they're very interested in general, I think. Uh, talking about mobile, th that's a bit of a dual situation, right? Because then you're also talking about operators that are very keen on looking at the traffic. So they're, they're not happy about everything being encrypted. Yeah, but the manufacturers of these, Manuf then they well, The manufacturers, they don't care. I mean, I'm talking operators, the ones who are actually running the networks you're using that on. Yeah. They want to look at the traffic. So, so that's a constant discussion about uh, revealing enough for the operators to be able to monitor your network. To, so, but yes, they're very uh, into f improving things for people with bad latency. So yeah, that's, a, that's certainly going to be a, a good improvement for mobile use. I would imagine handset developers would possibly be able to implement TLS in, in hardware performance in enhancements and stuff like that. Uh, well. Yes, I to think that's a, just a matter of time, really. And as um, once we can be sure that the spec won't change, I think hardware manufacturers will come up with ways to offload it. So yes, it, it will improve itself over time if we just give it some time. And I, I didn't mention it, but I can just as well do it. So for example, Quick has this fun feature, which is also very uh, mobile friendly, is that it is actually, you don't terminate connections on, on IP addresses. So they have a connection ID, which means that you can actually move the connection between interfaces in, in your computer or mobile phones. You can actually move the connection very easily between like Wi-Fi and mobile data or Wi-Fi and Ethernet. Uh, network interface on your computer, which is a, which is a dream for all mobile users, the, the, the so-called parking lot problem. You bring your phone on Wi-Fi and you bring it out to mobile data, what happens? With a, in a quick world, it'll just change interface and it'll just have that connection established. Well, that's not how you do it in the, in the, in the current era. So would that also mean that you could basically remove the IP layers and move the quick packaging even one layer down well, in, in, a, in well, a cellular in, Well, in theory, UDP isn't really used for anything here, right? So you could, in theory, remove a lot of things. Yeah, you could just go down into the to, into the G4 stack instead and, and the GSM stack, so. Yeah, oh, yes, yeah, I mean, yeah, sure, in theory, you, but I don't think anyone is actually trying to do that. <laughs> so I think this is enough for now, so. <laughs> <laughs> And does Quick support something like SNI to host multiple servers, multiple domains on this one yeah. server? Yes, I mean, it, it speaks SNI pretty much exactly like you do, it, like with regular TLS. So yes. Um, so, so again, it goes back to feature-wise from an HTTP standpoint, it looks really similar to HTTP that you're used to. If you think I'm uh, hard to understand, I also wrote this down in a little document um, that is available. Otherwise, I didn't actually intend to say anything more. Anyone wants the box? I may ask one more, maybe. And do you think it can somehow help with censorship circumvention? Because it's hard to think about it when you live in Sweden, for example, but on some countries like China, I don't know. Uh. <laughs> I think it can. And uh, I mean, in you, regular, I think that's, that's a discussion I'm involved in so much because that goes both ways, right? You encrypt more. So, yeah, that's much harder to. to intercept and censor and spy on. But what, what happens then? What, if, you're in a, if you're a regime who, who doesn't like this, maybe you just block everything that looks like this and then you haven't won anything. So I don't know if, it's, if you will win or lose in the, in the long run. Thanks.